Okay, the room is all seated, properly distanced. Uh, we're receiving meeting from Minister of Pension Officials, their time past. Still, isn't that right? Yes. Uh, there will be consideration of an SL1 number of our item or standing correspondence. Morris will be joining the meeting via the teleconference facility. He's here, Hello, Morris. The committee will be recorded throughout the whole apartment buildings and online. You can use your devices as long as they're on aeroplane mode. Um, do we have any apologies? Not at the minute, no. No. Um, right, members will be aware of the uh, recent death of John Dallet following his battle with cancer, and he's a long-standing uh, member of the Assembly here and indeed of this committee um, until not that terribly long ago when he was replaced by his colleague uh, Pat Catney here. And certainly, I'd like to pass my condolences to John. I've known him for quite a while he, on the DRD committee as well, and he's actually my next door neighbour up in floor three. So um, he's a he's a big loss, and, and I, I, know, I noted him even in January when he clearly was unwell. When we started back here and we're doing that backlog of SRs, he was still on top of it, even though he was clearly unwell. So um, he obviously was a very dedicated, and good public representative with a good level of ability, and he, he's a big loss here, but especially I think to his family as well. So members be um, uh, content that we do a letter to John's family. Yes. Okay. And she'd also say as well, uh, Pat, following the death of your mother as well, we'll take the opportunity to pass uh, condolences as well on the, the death of your mother a number of weeks ago as well. Okay. Do you want to go to page four and do the minutes and correspondence yeah. while we're waiting? Yeah. Just, okay, do you want to move on, members, to page four, the uh, minutes and correspondence? Draft minutes are page 47. Yeah, that's page 47 to 57. It's the, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of March, page 47 to 57. Are members content with the, um, the minutes? Okay. I hear them. Okay. Um, I want to just refer to the note of the informal committee meeting on the 30th of April, pages 58 to 60. Our members agree with the note of the informal meeting, and are you content for the note to be published on the committee web page and a tweet issued on the uh, Twitter account? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, the correspondence. Mm -hmm. okay, confer members to correspondence on the index page of 63 to 65. This is correspondence which the committee has not been able to consider due to not formally meeting until today. Uh, we now have the opportunity to clear the outstanding correspondence. Each item has been suggested an action against it. And members would wish to note that further letters on the Polish beef matter have been received from Little, the Co op, and Minister Putz, Duns. Uh, I'm sorry, Duns, Nisa, and Naimia. Uh, we are waiting for a reply from them. Um, are members okay to action the correspondence uh, as suggested? Chair, could I just make a note or point out that um, number three there um, yep. is, was a, a correspondence from the All Party Group rather than the Green Party? Okay. Is that okay? okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry. They're, they're here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, members. Okay. Um. So, hello, Norman. Okay. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, um, welcome Minister Pooch and Norman here before today, and um, and whilst 
we have uh, expressed condolences to yourself, Minister, in the Chamber recently. This is your first time before the committee since the passing of your father. So I just want to take the opportunity on behalf of the committee to express our condolences to you and your family at this uh, very difficult time. Thank you. And could I record my condolences to the Dalit family? John was a member of this committee um, for the first part there until recently. And uh, we're sad to hear of his untimely passing. And uh, he still had a lot to give, and unfortunately, he's not going to have the opportunity to do that. Thank you, Minister Pitch. Uh, so, okay, and David, David here to you. Okay, so I'd like to invite you, Minister, to uh, commence the briefing, and then following that, so the members will have the opportunity uh, to ask some questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Looking around at the unusual seated positions here, Mr. Irwin, I thought he was. Join the Clarks for a while, you know. He's in the naughty corner. He's in the naughty corner. Good place for him. Um, thank you, anyway, for the opportunity to address the committee today on the department's recent work in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So, <clears throat> when you invited to me to speak to you, you flagged up some issues in particular that you wanted me to talk through. So, we'll go through those one by one. And I know the situation has changed from when you asked about these issues, and you may have new priorities now, which um, are absolutely fine. We'll deal with those. I did address some of your questions in the statement that I made last Thursday to the Ad Hoc Committee. I don't want to go over old ground, but with your permission, Chair, I'll start with the issues you raised and answer any questions you might have. So, waste management. During the COVID-19 pandemic period, it has been critically important that councils maintain their curbside collections. Recycling services are vital in order to safeguard human health, protect the environment and sustain the recycled business and market. In the beginning of this pandemic, all 101 household recycling centres in Northern Ireland were closed. On the 20th of April, I published five key principles to help councils decide if and when it is safe to reopen their, their centres. And these were <coughs> the protection of human health and the environment, social equity, waste hierarchy, resilience and preservation of material flows. I provided guidance on how to safely reopen recycling centres, and this week an increasing number of councils are now uh, reopening them. For example, Mid and East Antrim have reopened their remaining centres, Causeway, Coast and Glens have reopened all 11 centres, Antrim and Newton Avia have reopened two, and I have no doubt that other councils will be making their decisions over coming days. My officials have worked with the Strategic Investment Board and the councils in developing a new municipal waste tracker, and this has proven to be a very valuable tool to monitor provision of councils' waste management services and the broader capacity within the waste sector, ensuring relevant issues are flagged and managed with daily updates. The tool has also been used to monitor the issue of fly tipping, in which most councils have seen an increase during the current period. Also, my department has published temporary regulatory position statements that puts in place pragmatic arrangements with defined conditions which operators may rely on to operate outside the normal regulatory conditions of their waste management licence during this COVID period. My officials have engaged with the Chief Planner to promote a consistent approach through these position statements where waste management licence conditions are common to or derived from planning permissions. Then uh, the closure of parks and, and the public angling estate. As the coronavirus pandemic developed during March, I introduced a number of closure measures across Deers Forest Parks, Country Parks <coughs> and Angling Estates, uh, which have supported social distancing and non-essential travel restrictions. Pedestrian access to these assets uh, are now open to provide local people with a spacious environment to exercise in a manner consistent with public health advice and social distancing. However, at present, the facilities within the department's parks and angling estates remain closed, and the car parks are closed where possible. Overall, I'm pleased to report a high level of compliance with guidance and adherence to COVID-19 regulations in the parks, and I'm of the view that it is not, not the appropriate time um, just yet to reopen vehicular access, but it's something that we're continuing to look at. However, um, the department will engage with other outdoor recreation providers and key stakeholders to help us inform future recovery <coughs> options. And I will, of course, keep this under review and pay close attention to public health and travel advice and guidance. It is important to remind people to only access those assets by themselves or with members of their household, and that people should not meet up in groups with members of their wider family circle 
or friends at these locations, also to remind the public that they can only access those sites on foot, and in particular to avoid any unnecessary travel. Food security. DERA is now nominated as the lead department for food security, so I'll give you a bit more work in, in monitoring what we're doing on it. On a clear understanding that other departments have strategic and tactical roles to undertake uh, to support food security. Food security has been management of risk along the entire food chain, from the farm to fork, including the, important, the import of raw materials, such as animal feedstuff, food processing, distrib distribution and consumption, which every bit as important as primary production considerations. It is a topic that encompasses food availability, access affordability, safety, nutrition and quality, resilience and confidence. And if we have learnt one thing from the current crisis, we should not take the supply of food for granted. As seen at the outset of the COVID-19 crisis, consumer behaviour can result in shortages on the shelves as they stockpile at home. And this is not an indication of any fragility in the supply of products, but a temporary disruption to buying and storage norms, where actual consumption does not change. While earlier periods of panic buying were purely due, due to perception um, of supply chain risk, where genuine supply issues arise, this could result in a heightened level of public reaction. Financial pressures to the ferry operators and hauliers have the potential to significantly impact supply lines entering Northern Ireland, as well as the shipment of processed food to external markets. The local supply base is also dependent on imports of grains and other materials to feed livestock, grow crops, etc. Logistics and connectivity are therefore essential. It is also clear that we need to have a coordinated approach across the Northern Ireland Executive. Produce moving off farms, including milk. At the onset of, out of the pandemic, there was a risk of absenteeism in the input supply. Downstream transporting and processing sectors might disrupt the movement of inputs and outputs to and from farms. These concerns, concerns have not materialised beyond the problems that are being experienced by the non-edible horticulture sector. The risk of produce not moving off farm um, in the rest of the sectors appear to have reduced particularly as we have now seemed to have reached the peak in the terms of COVID infections. However, it remains a possibility, <clears throat> and my officials are continuing to monitor the situation closely. While the earlier risks are subsiding, other risks are now escalating due to downstream market disruptions, feed back, feeding back up the supply chain <coughs> to primary producers through price movements. Consequently, we are reassessing which response might be needed taking on board the measures announced by UKG, such as the Self-Employed Support Scheme and the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme. Moving to the strain on the food processing um, industries, while supply chains are working effectively, there remains significant concerns across all stakeholders that staff availability for work could decline quickly as fear of contracting the virus um, remains within the workforce. Calls have been made by the industry for COVID-19 tests to be made available for key workers within the agri-food sector to help ensure <coughs> excuse me, adequate numbers of staff are available to maintain the food supply chain. My department has been working with agri-food stakeholders to identify the type and number of key workers um, that could be tested. Following commencement of this testing programme, it is reported that staff within the food processing sector are now availing of it and it is working well. Results are being made available within 24 hours, which has provided reassurance to the workforce. My department has worked with Northern Ireland Food and Drink Association, EMEA, and the HSENI in developing protocols in relation to social distancing on production lines and businesses are each putting their own measures in place to protect and reassure staff in line with current guidance. The NIFTA estimate that the food processing sector is currently producing to 100 per cent of retail customer demand but not necessarily 100 per cent of previous production levels, due to the severe impact of COVID-19 on the food service and hospitality sector. They also report that absenteeism within the sector has reduced to below 7 per cent on average on the 29th of April, from a high of 14 per cent on the 3rd of April. Operation of Livestock March Livestock March closed voluntarily on the 23rd of March 2020 in response to COVID-19 health and safety concerns. Since then, officials have maintained regular contact with livestock mart operators and have been reassured that robust operational protocols developed by March 
in conjunction with other stakeholders, including the Health and Safety Executive, will enable them to conduct business in a manner which is safe for staff, farmers and buyers, and adheres to social distancing requirements. Livestock marks play a crucial role in the essential supply of food to our citizens, and have welcomed the decision by uh, the Livestock Auctioneers Association um, to reopen livestock marks on a gradual basis. Sixteen markets recommenced sales last week, implementing new protocols. A further five markets, um, I believe it's now six, um, are, have recommenced sales this week. And video technology has been used at a number of mart venues over past weeks and will continue to be used. Industry feedback on the use of technology has been positive. Farmers, like all businesses, are facing financial difficulties as a result, result of COVID-19, and being able to trade again at March will provide much-needed cash flow. To date, COVID-19 has impacted agricultural markets in Northern Ireland due to initial panic buying in retail. A sharp shift in consumer demand away from food service to retail, with the closure of the hospitality sector, uh, market restrictions, food service products being stored, and uncertainty in the wider economy. These effects are now being beginning to manifest themselves in falling prices for farm produce. In particular, the main milk processors have indicated that the price they pay to farmers for March raw milk intake will drop to a, by between 1 and 1.5p per litre for the previous month. It is also expected that with the dramatic impact of COVID-19 on in international dairy markets, further sharp reductions will be applied to prices in the months ahead. Reef prices have also started to fall with coats currently around 17p per kilo, which is 5% less than those of March, and further reductions are also widely expected. To support markets, the EU Commission announced private storage aid for skimmed skim milk powder, butter, cheese, beef and veal and sheep meat. And while this will provide some assistance to markets, I still re remain concerned about the market situation, particularly in the dairy and beef sector where farmers could be face, facing further price reductions over coming months. Such price falls will lead to a severe reduction in farm incomes and increased borrowings. Furthermore, while I appreciate the COVID-19 self-employment income support scheme and the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme might be of benefit to agricultural businesses, I do not believe that they are sufficient on their own, and have not been designed with agricultural business in mind which have to keep running as before, and hence incurring full costs with lower market returns. Issues around ferry transport and export of goods. The ability of food processors to operate in a crisis is hugely important, but it is more about maintaining the flow of produce off-farm than securing the supply of food for local customers. The majority of processed food supplies from uh, our factories are destined uh, for markets beyond Northern Ireland. And there are emerging financial pressures on local primary producers, especially in the milk and beef sectors, and also in ornamental horticulture, which could have a longer impact on the Northern Ireland supply line. It is also vital to ensure that there are sufficient and ongoing supplies to farms of essential, including animal feeds, seeds and chemicals for this year's growing season, sufficient available labour, and that produce can reach the market. In most respects, this is in hand, but we need to look closely at an emerging problem. And as a result of the disruption of shipping and international supply chains, the executive is already aware of the problems for ferries and hauliers, and of the work in hand with the Department of Transport and Her Majesty's Treasury to su secure support. As an example, the executive has agreed to contribute to a DFT package of support for ferry operators. The support package is for the three main ferry companies and facilitates the five major Irish sea routes. However, the ferries only solve a part of the supply chain problem. Supply chain is critically reliant on hauliers for goods importing and exporting to and from Northern Ireland. And NICS officials with my department driving this issue are urgently working on an evidence base uh, to understand the NI specific situation. Finally, assistance for horticulture. The ornamental horticulture production sector in Northern Ireland <coughs> has around 210 growers and is worth around £24 million per annum. There is a narrow window for sales of plants, such as bedding and cut flowers, with 60 per cent of annual sales occurring between March and June. Most plants have a shelf life in the nursery of two to five weeks and cut flowers a number of days. Thereafter, they are unfit for market. Normal routes to markets include garden centres, multiple retailers and other retail stores in Northern Ireland and ROI. But they are either closed or focused their intention on selling other products that are deemed to be more essential. And due to these unique circumstances, ornamental horticultural businesses are now facing huge financial losses. I therefore ask that the opportunity to reopen uh, businesses such as garden centres 
could be given serious consideration while still observing the necessary health and safety requirements. That will provide this sector with a route to market for their produce and will also enable people to recommence gardening that provides physical and mental health well-beings. Should this proposal gain support, <clears throat> I would be happy to offer the support from my own officials to help businesses to operate safely and within the government guidance um, on safeguarding. Chair, sure, at this point I have addressed the nine points you wanted me to cover. I can continue um, to update you on a range of priority issues, or if you prefer that the committee would ask questions at this point, I am happy to with, with, with whichever. Thank you, Minister. Um, I take the opportunity to ask questions at this point. That be fair enough. Sure. Um, Minister, just I'll kick, kick off here. There's just a, a couple of a couple of points I just want to mention. Um, see, in relation to the national testing program for the frontline uh, workers in the, um, uh, the food food supply and the food processing sector, um, I I note that uh, in situations where they are have to say self isolate or someone in their house is self isolating, they can uh, get tested. Mm -hmm. However, I'm aware that the three uh, testing centres are in Derry, um, Rugby Club. The SSE in Belfast and the Craig Allen MOT Centre. Now, if you're living in southwest Fermanagh, for example, that's probably the best part of a 200 mile round trip to get to any of those three centres. Um, and I, I'm not certain that um, a rule proofing would come into this here where this has been rule proofed. So, would, would you agree with me that um, but that places those agri food workers at a disadvantage to other workers in the north, having to travel those distances to access those centres, albeit it's very welcome that we finally have moved to the mm. reason of testing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I understand where you're coming from, and in terms of the distances involved, um, I, I suppose that they're reaching as many people as possible. Um, without overexposing themselves in terms of the establishment, the, the, the running off and, and um, response times to, to, to this. So it isn't our it isn't our it wasn't our role that we, we weren't involved in the setting of it up, but that that's I suppose the perspective that they'd have came from. We possibly be draw to the attention of the PHA that for work, agri food workers involved in the industry and those parts that it's it's it plays them at a slight yeah. advantage. Well it's not just agri food workers. Yeah. I know we're I mean, an agri uh, an agri food committee as such, but <clears throat> you take the workers who people who are in care homes and things like that there, you know, it multiplies up into substantial numbers in due course. Um, and before we move on, the second thing I want to mention was you made reference, uh, Minister, to the the various schemes and that they weren't designed for the agri businesses in mind. Um, and I, I'm aware that the, that there has been um, representation made for a wider EU Westminster support package for yep. the industry here. But just looking at the uh, self-employed scheme, and whilst it's welcome that the self-employed scheme is available for the agri food businesses here, that's very welcome. Um, but I, I do note that uh, based on your, your certainly, if you take the farm income um, business, the average farm income. Um, for last year, for example, as to how relevant or how eligible farms would be for that there. Mm. If you take, for example, the cattle and sheep, both LFA and Lowland, you know, their um, average earnings is you know, say twelve thousand pounds, it was even lower this year. And that at, even at twelve thousand pounds, if you take uh, per month that would be uh, one thousand, take away twenty percent, which makes it eight hundred, then minus tax. So that would translate to probably just over £600 a month for cattle and sheep, uh, both LFA and Lowland, from the South and South Support Scheme. So that would have a very, very negligible impact on those farmers at all. And, you know, and again, so the point, Sandy, is whilst, whilst certain farmers, maybe in other sectors where their income is slightly higher, Will, will be able to avail of the South and South Scheme and will have an impact, albeit um, you know, maybe not enough to. You know, sustain their businesses. For those particular sectors, um, cattle and sheep, this will have no impact, at, no impact yeah. at all, and there is no safety net for them. So, would would you would you agree with me that it is important to look at some sort of a, a small business scheme for that particular sector who are particularly vulnerable at this time? I do agree with you that it's not going to benefit um, some of those who need it most. Um, in fact, most of those who need it most. So, uh, I do think that. 
and I've said it for, for, for a number of weeks now, we need something which is bespoke and something which is um, that, that can be delivered to those those who need it most and will benefit most um, of any funding that comes forward. Um, the EU scheme we can apply to, but it's an 80 million euro scheme for all of the EU, so it, it, they didn't exactly break the bank like they'd done something, but uh, it wasn't very much. But nonetheless, um, our meat plants or dairy um, processors can apply for aids to private storage, and I would encourage them to do that where they're finding um, surplus material that they have trouble offloading. Um, however, I have pressed the, the UK government quite um, consistently um, on um, getting a package, and I've raised that at the executive on a number of occasions. <coughs> I'm raising it at the executive again tomorrow under any other business. And at this stage, um, I think that we can't really afford to wait about much longer on whether the UK government comes forward with a package. That is for us and the Northern Ireland executive to, to divvy up. And I've been hugely supportive of the hospitality sector, of transportation, you know, all of the other sectors that have benefited thus far um, from some kinds of support, uh, on the basis that this is what is required to get people on the other side of COVID-19 to resume their businesses, to resume their jobs, and uh, have an economy after this is all over. And that principle that's been applied to everybody else shouldn't be any different um, than for that of the farming community and the primary producers. And they need some support to get them to the other side of COVID-19 as well. So we're seeing a number of areas where, where they're taking a hit, other areas where it isn't so bad. So we need to focus on the areas where it's taking a hit. And um, I, I would be keen for, for the, the support of this committee, as I keep banging the drum for um, farmers um, in the executive, uh, that we get some um, support package put, brought forward. And just say this, that um, if the executive um, are willing to do something, you know, I'm willing to search about the department and see what we can do to assist that as well. So I'm not going to the executive with a begging bowl asking them to, to do it all. If we can assist, um, we're, we'll be more than willing to, to do that within the department as well. Thank you, Minister. Um, I will take the opportunity to move for our end uh, committee members, both <coughs> committee members of Indicate to want to speak. So, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, can I thank the Minister for coming along today and for his tireless, tireless efforts in supporting the industry through this important and trying time. And I think the industry has to be commended from the farmer right through to the processor. Uh, thousands of people are working daily in the processing sector, working tirelessly uh, to make sure that there's food on, the, on our supermarket stores and food on the table for everyone. So I think they all need to be commended for that. Uh, as the Minister has said and is aware, there's a number of sectors that are probably feeling the pain the most and uh, would, uh, would be in need of some sort of a package to try and help them through it. Is the Minister aware of any discussions between the, finance, the Department of Finance and the Treasury in relation to assuring more, acquiring more money for the farms? Um, I'm not, and, and that would need to be asked of the Department of Finance. Um, I know we have pressed the issue at the Executive, and we have corresponded with the Department of Finance. And uh, we are keen to, to establish that support. Um, we have been corresponding directly with DEFRA, um, and it is through DEFRA that that has went to um, the Chancellor. Uh, but that hasn't delivered as yet, and uh, West. You don't give up hope um, while, while there's still potential. Uh, it, is, it has proven quite challenging um, to get money out of the Chancellor for farming, and I should say haulage as well. And uh, I am convinced that the haulage sector needs support and would like to see it getting support because if we don't have the haulage sector, we'll not have a food industry for very long here. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, Philip, thank you. Uh, just following on from the last two questions, and I mean, obviously, uh, it would be great to see a package coming from uh, the British Exchequer 
or the executive to help and support uh, the agriculture sector. But just as you were finishing, you said that you would also look about the department's budget. I mean, I, I would have expected that that work would be uh, happening within the department. Uh, I mean, because I mean, obviously in the middle of a crisis, but there will be certain work streams where there will be reduced budgetary uh, pressure. So I mean, I would expect that work yeah. to be ongoing. That that wasn't the point. So just briefly, I'm just or that uh, as additional to my questions, uh, in relation to Brexit, uh, I mean, there all businesses across the north uh, are focusing on the COVID-19 crisis and, and to a greater or lesser degree, you know, that has had major impacts with the business community across and particularly the agri-food and our farming sector. And I mean, I'm aware of, of people who are, are lobbying me in terms of the impact of that and also the double whammy of potentially uh, Brexit happening as well. And I mean, I, I know the minister is, is aware that the sector is asking for a pause on the Brexit proposals until we can come out the other side of, of this current crisis that we're in. So, I mean, is that something that he is, uh, an issue that he is uh, lobbying the, the Westminster government on uh, with regard to pausing uh, Brexit until this crisis is dealt with? And then just very finally, it on our briefings over the last number of weeks, the issue of environmental NGOs is on. Uh, and I know it, it's saying something similar every week and that there's meetings happening. I mean, obviously one of the if there's been anything positive that has come out of this, uh, the, a positive effect on our environment uh, is maybe one of them, and, and it would be important that our uh, environmental NGOs see their way through this crisis as well, because they will have a, a big part to play in, in the new normal, as we talk about, on the far side of this. So just maybe if there was a further update on that as well. Okay. Right. Um, well, there's th th three issues are Initially, very quickly, the department is lo looking at, at that, that course of work being done within the department. Um, so, but we are a small department um, in terms of our day-to-day -day administration costs. Um, so, when you take the single farm payment element out of it, um, we aren't a department which is running about with many hundreds of millions. Um, so, what 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 we will be able to produce will be helpful, but it's not going to not going to resolve issues. Um, so, but we, we we will do our best to to augment anything that's brought forward. Um, secondly, in relation to Brexit, I'm aware that the agri-food industry is concerned that it's struggling to cope with the challenges of the COVID-19 situation. And uh, the UK government has taken a clear stance that U the EU exit will continue as planned with no extension to the implementation period. So that's been repeated over and over again in various meetings that I've been at. And <clears throat> the industry is concerned that it doesn't have the bandwidth to, to deal with the implications of COVID-19 and provide the necessary engagement on the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, future UK-EU trade negotiations and UK rest of the world trade issues. I recognise these concerns. At this point, the Executive hasn't taken a position on whether it should ask for an extension to the implementation period. Um, and when this issue is considered, of course, um, we will reflect industry concerns. Um, do highlight that the UK government has not given no hint whatsoever that is prepared to reconsider the position. So, the position has been raised at a number of meetings that I have been at. Um, the Scots and the Welsh, in particular, have pressed very hard on it, um, but there has been no give shown whatsoever at this point. Uh, NGOs, environmental NGOs. NGO, yeah, sorry. Um, NGOs and. and this is one that um, obviously we got £22 million extra for charities, um, so they fall under the, 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 the field of charities. DOF is leading in this. DFC have a very significant role to play in it. Um, we will request that, that the NGOs that are registered charities um, within our remit um, are not forgotten about whenever they're actually distributing that £22 million. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for coming this afternoon and You're welcome. Um, giving us the latest update. Just, um, some of the questions I was going to ask have been answered, but two, two others I want to just bring to ask you about. In relation to recycling centres, mm -hmm. speaking to some of the councillors, while I understand the need to open them, and living in the West, there's a lot of fly tipping. I can say, and the need for them to be open. 
there is a concern that while your curbside waste, your waste from your bins that are lifted in the curbside, they, that, that's okay, that seems to be, they can lift them and they can get rid of that waste. But other goods maybe that are, I use the word goods, but other um, stuff that's brought into the recycling centres, some of the councils are concerned that when their skips etc are full, or they won't be fit to then get rid of that. For example, old white goods and things, things yeah. like that. Have you, has that been brought to your attention, or are you aware of that? Actually, I'm picking up the reverse. So right. The industry is saying to me, we 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 need materials, and we're not getting it. Uh -huh. So, yeah. for example, we we had a meeting last week, um, Zoom conference meeting, um, and company which is using um, waste to, to generate energy is finding it more difficult to get materials and, and this isn't just an NI problem, it's, it's right across UK and Ireland. Um, so that, 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 that's proven to be an issue. I know that um, there's another facility which, which burns a lot of the w wood and generates electricity um, up in Lutonderry and it's, it's got the same problem um, in that they still have enough but it's, they're very concerned about, about the amounts that are coming in. So the recycling, a lot of the recycling companies would be keen to be getting more material at this stage. So I, sometimes I, I wonder, the council officers are maybe playing a line to some of, some of the councillors. I think there is strong demand for a lot of that, yeah. that, that material, and that's, that's what I've been hearing <coughs> from the recycling companies. Uh -huh. Well, I'm wondering if... Would it be possible then for the lay of yourself to feed that back to councillors and Very happy to. Um, chief executives, etc.? Yeah. Because that seems to be thought in the West. Anyway. Mm -hmm. so, no, um, fair enough. And the, the other question is in relation to car parks being closed where necessary. And this has been the end of my life. Yeah. <laughs> As you know, I've spoken to you about or communicate with you. I understand the need for car parks to be closed. I do understand that. But at the same time, these cars are coming, parking along the roadside, bumper to bumper. And what's the difference in them sitting parked along the roadside, bumper to bumper, and families pushing out and in between cars, than them actually being perhaps parked in a car park? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I suppose. Our problems became highlighted, it seems ages ago now, but there was a prickly nice weekend. It was the first good weekend of the year. <clears throat> and some of our facilities were just bursting at the steams, and they were parked outside as well in those days. But the likes of Tullymore Forest Park and Castlewell and Hillsborough, you know, just, those were just ones that I know offhand because they're more local to me. Um, and probably the same for everybody else's as well. They were bursting at the seams. And we were supposed to be. We, we moved into the lockdown the next day, so we just couldn't live with the message that it's okay just to go out and do that, um, because there's just too many people within the sites at that point. <coughs> at this stage, people are being good about observing social distancing. Um, would it be possible to open car parks? I think it would be. I'd like to get a wee bit more space in terms of if the message is stay at home. It's not really appropriate, but if the message moves from stay at home to a more stay safe message, social distance and all of that there, and allows a bit more flexibility on travel, then I'm certainly very happy to look at that. But while the message is stay at home, stay safe and all of that there, and you're not supposed to travel, um, it would sort of be contradictory um, to me to, to, to do that. But I can see the sense of what you were saying at the same time, Rosemary. Yeah, okay. And I get it, but yeah. but it's, it's it's a wee tricky situation <coughs> that I find myself in. Okay. This isn't uncommon. Thank you. Just I'll just add very briefly because it's the same topic. Um, I've mentioned just sent you an email there uh, before this meeting starts. You don't have a chance to even look at, but I just want to draw to your attention that uh, one of our councillors in South Town uh, drew our attention to an issue in the Castlewell and Forest Park at the weekend, whereby an ambulance couldn't access the, the park because there, I think there's bollards or something at the entrance to it. Right. Uh, so 
perhaps that bit probably will apply to all of the parks. Mm -hmm. uh, so perhaps that's something that we looked at. If there's protocols to be agreed with the ambulance service, should they have to access the parks in an emergency? Well, it's a reasonable point. It's one we need to take into consideration. Um, I know that in Hillsborough, for example, the gates were closed, so it would be no different. You know, you couldn't get uh, you could get an ambulance closer, to, certainly closer to where someone took a heart attack, for example, or you know, became ill. So I dropped an email just about full meetings for info okay. because you love time dealing with what's in the it's in your inbox. Okay, yeah. well, it's something we'll take into consideration because that, it's not something that I that I had really taken into consideration. Uh, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister, and uh, Norman and David for being here today. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay, and one relating to the update you've just provided us, and another on the update you gave to the ad hoc committee on Thursday, if uh -huh. that will be okay. Sure. Um, looking at the ornamental horticulture sector, um, back to that, and your appeal then for the opening of garden centres, and while that is a welcome move for garden centres and will alleviate, as you say, some of the pressures on the sector by allowing a route to market. However, it comes too late for many of the growers. Um, without a compensation package in place, these businesses are still set to go under. Um, and I have no doubt that you are aware of the exclusion of wholesale horticultural nurseries, for example, from the Small Business Rates Relief Grant Scheme due to the fact that they do not have um, rateable value. Um, and perhaps seems a wee bit straightforward to maybe use an alternative like a VAT returns to generate an interim payment, for example. But growers have told me that they were informed by DERA that department officials have been in contact with the Department of Economy in relation to getting um, businesses included within the grant scheme. Um, and a further FOI request um, that was sent then into the department stated that there had been no communication as outlined. Um, in the request for the period stipulated. Now, maybe that FOI was a, a poorly worded one or asking the wrong information. So I want to maybe ask you then um, if you could give us information on what plan has been put together uh, and can we get concrete information on what that plan for that sector looks like? Because unless something is done as urgently as this week, we could lose between the third and half of our seasonal growing sector, I'm being informed. Okay. Um, listen, I feel an immense amount of sympathy for, for the horticulture people at this moment in time because I, I, I get a sense it's like a, a farmer who who'd be have his wheat and barley ready to cut and the sun's shining and they're not allowed to put a combine in the field. You know, they have spent all winter, you know, propagating plants and looking after them and, and, and carrying out all the work that's needed to, to bring them to market. And the very point whenever they should be selling that product, and that product has a, a limited shelf life, um, they've been told, no, you can't do it. So my number one priority is to get garden centres opened safely. And I believe that the capacity to do it is, is there. It's, it's not an issue. And, and I know that um, in GB they actually have developed a, a, a paper to, to support the argument, an, an extensive paper, an extensive document uh, to support it. Um, but you know, the logic of it is you are going into a space the size of this building and you might have 50 people in it at one stage, and yet you have people – and the old off-licence is always scared of I think, I, Personally, I think it was the right decision about the off-licence because it would have impacted upon the supermarkets. But, you know, if people start in queuing to get into an off-licence, which is the size of this room, and you, they, they would have the same throughput of people going through that as you would have going through a garden centre. So I don't think it is a defensible position for the executive to take um, to not open garden centres, and I would hope that that will be addressed and addressed very quickly. Um, however, they may well still need to be to get some form of financial support, and they have been part of um, our argument to the Department of Finance and to the Executive. It hasn't just been about farmers; it's been about that, that horticultural sector as well. Um, and we can better assess it if they're allowed to open. We can better assess their need. So the need will be much greater, and the cost to the public purse will be much greater if they're not allowed to open. Uh, if they are allowed to open. Um, compensation that may be required would, would, would be reduced significantly, um, because obviously they'd be getting a lot more sales and income through that me method, but recognising that 
if March to June is our key period, we're now, at, we're now in May, so they've already lost two months. Okay. Thank you. Um, can, can I maybe just ask that? Uh, have are you working on plans for? Uh, it's my understanding that there are some within that sector who have been told that, that, that there are um, work going on within the department to put in place some sort of financial package, um, but yet nobody knows what that is. So, is, can you give us something concrete in terms of what's going on? Because they have tried to FOI the department and still not getting yeah. any information back. We, we've made the request, Claire, to the executive um, for financial support both for horticulture, for, for this particular sector, and for the dairy and, 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 and red meat sector in the main. Um, and we've already supported fishing, and we're looking at aquaculture as well. Um, but in this particular sector, we have asked for it. Um, and the Department of Finance says we need more information, so that's a course of work that's being done. The final decision on this can't be made until we know whether they're going to be open or closed. Because they're going to be closed for another month or six weeks. They're going to need basically their entire sales is is is, is wiped out for for the, for this period. I know some of them are doing you know um, collections and, and delivering to people's homes and all, but it's it's just not going to cut it. Um, it's not going to be the same as as people going in and, and going through a garden centre and, and identifying what they want and taking that home. So we recognise that that if they can get open that the cost to the public purse will be considerably reduced um, if they are forced to stay closed. Um, I do not believe that we will achieve anything in terms of public health, but we will ensure that many businesses are put into real um, dire straits, and the consequence of that is that they will have an expectation that we will help them in some way, because we force them um, to close our businesses for their, their busiest period. And to do that without any offer of compensation, you know, I just do not think that and we as a government can stand up with that. Okay. Like, maybe go on to the second question then. Is that okay? Just in relation to your statement, uh, or your update to the ad hoc committee last week, I think you made a very interesting statement that I would like to maybe follow up with you then. Um, and it was on our environment um, and agriculture. Um, and when you said that agriculture is not the environmental problem that some people have suggested it is. Um, so yeah. I went back into facts from your own department and looking at um, your own department states that agriculture accounts for 27 per cent of greenhouse gas em emissions in Northern Ireland, for example, um, and deforestation has led to Northern Ireland being a net emitter rather than a carbon sink. Um, excess use of fertilisers, other harmful farming practices have resulted in loss of biodiversity, harmful ammonia emissions, and it goes on and on. This is all the information from your own department, and I was just wondering then, <coughs> With the statement that or that that, um, that you give on Thursday, then agriculture is not the environmental problem that some people have suggested it is. Who are those some people, and where's the evidence then to show that? Well, I think I think the fact that whenever we have seen agriculture carry on uh, as it has been um, right across the world, and where we have the same population in the world, but we're seeing um, massive improvements in the environment. Uh, it's fairly evident that uh, the places who are not working to the, the extent that they are are those who are causing the most damage to the environment. That's 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 very clear. Now, in terms of agriculture, you know, people are very good at talking about how much um, gas a cow produces, and there's a logic to all of this, which doesn't seem to be applied by people who should be a bit more logical. A cow produces so much gas because she eats carbon enriched grass. And the grass is carbon enriched because it draws that out of the atmosphere in the first instance. And no one seems to actually, not no one, but a, a lot of people haven't got their heads around, but they need, do need to get their heads around, around it. That grass is a capture of carbon and a form of carbon sequestration. And the roots of grass, as it develops each year, as the older grass gets, the more it is sequestrating carbon. And people just seem to want to talk about the emissions, but don't want to talk about the carbon sink that exists. So every field out there 
that contains grass, hedges and trees is a carbon sink. And that's how we need to be looking at our fields and at our farms <coughs> at this stage. And we need to be recognising the carbon capture that has taken place. As a consequence of that, the old cow who gets blamed for doing so much damage to the environment is actually utilising that grass that, 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 that is capturing the carbon in the first instance. She not only captures the grass doesn't only capture carbon which the cow then eats and emits back, which creates a circle. Um, in the times of year whenever the, 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 the conditions are slightly wetter, and uh, that's most times of the year in Northern Ireland, um, in Ireland and, and indeed uh, GB, the cow tramps grass into the soil, which is a further capture of carbon. So people really need to get their heads around and start and do some scientific based work on what is actually captured in terms of carbon by grass and by animal production and, and, and how, how they utilise grass and indeed how they actually tramp grass back into the soil. This is something I learned about many, many years ago. Um, but the big lobbies want to entirely ignore it. The big NGOs want to entirely ignore it. And it's an easy thing to go after farming. Um, and it's an easy thing to identify the emissions coming from the cow. Um, but none of them want to try and make any effort whatsoever um, at uh, the, the benefits of carbon sequestration that is found from grass. I've had um, good conversations um, with AFPE representatives um, who specialise in grass management, and they are absolutely certain that there is substantial carbon sequestration and um, comes from grass. So, whenever you, maybe you don't go past any fields on your way home tonight, Claire, but if you do, go to <coughs> carbon six, as are our peat bogs, which are even better carbon six, um, as are our forests, which are even better carbon six, but every field of grass is a carbon six. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, it's good to see everybody in the flesh today for a wee change. Nice to Harry. Thank you. <laughs> and welcome, Yolo Master, and thank you very much for your report today. Um, <clears throat> some great news on your report, Minister. I uh, must admit, especially the opening of the livestock march. That's something that I think was a major necessity, and I really would welcome that. But there is one issue that really concerns me. And that's the prices of milk. I mean, I don't know what we can or cannot do about that, but that I would see as a future worry going forward for an awful lot of our farmers in this mm. country. Yeah, uh, I, I left my phone upstairs. I was, I was going to look at because uh, there, there was um, new prices for various milk commodities yesterday, um, world, world based prices. Yes. And Butter was down about five and a half percent, and dried milk was down, which are two commodities which which which, which we are selling quite heavily. Um, however, cheeses were up seven percent, which is um, another another one which we are, are very good at, and, and one particular company which really specialises in that. Um, but overall, the prices were not down as bad as what one might have anticipated. And we are now seeing some orders opening up in the Far East, so, so it would appear that there is some movement in the Chinese market again, um, and the African market has, has stayed there, which is mainly dried milk. So we, we, need to, we need to watch this very closely over the course of the next number of, of weeks and months. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that for the primary producer, they have already seen a reduction of 6%, so the one half pay litre from 25p to 23.5 is a 6% reduction. That was before anything had fed through. So we'll just mark the cards of, of, of those who are in the, the middlemen and, and the retailers that the overall price perhaps they've already taken the hit 
and maybe not necessary for there to be any further reduction in price, um, given what the world market prices seem, seem to be indicating at this moment in time. Um, obviously, there, there are a number of areas that, that have been hit quite badly, and the service sector is, is one of them. So the food service sector, where you see the likes of the coffee shops closing down, you know, huge demand for, for, for milk for those nice big lattes and so forth. And, you're told you don't tend to make that. You just in order to make a black coffee with a, with a dash of milk in it, you know. So people don't tend to do the same at home as, as, as they do when they're out. So <coughs> retail trade did pick up some of it, but they didn't take it, pick up at all. Um, so we're very keen, and, and um, I've engaged in a number of meetings um, to see some of those facilities opening up again, even on a um, the, the drive-throughs or, or, or whatever. So McDonald's, for example, were taking 12% of Northern Ireland beef. <coughs> you know, your coffee shops were taking huge quantities of, of, of milk. Um, Kentucky Fried Chicken were using 500,000 chickens a week. So whenever you take you know, big players like that out of the system, um, that is an impact. Then you have all of your restaurants and all of that on top of it. But I would like to see uh, those facilities. and. They're 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 reluctant themselves to open up and on unless they get a lot of assurances and I can understand that. So when you as a customer, you know, enter one of those premises and you see someone here and someone right here and they're both working away in, in a relatively small area, you're saying where's the social distancing for the workers? So they they they're very concerned that they don't open till they get that right. Um, but those facilities opening, um, certainly for the users, um, can be done safely. And uh, again, it's back to this issue of uh, are you going to be allowed to travel? And if you are going to be allowed to travel, um, it strikes me as being entirely reasonable. You know, People are going to buy chips on the week weekend, mostly in the weekend, but during the week as well. Like, Very nice. Or there are Chinese restaurants or Indian restaurants, and those facilities are open. So. It would strike me that you know your McDonald's or your Kentucky Fried Chickens or your Costa Coffees or whatever it happens to be um, should be uh, in a position where if it's safe for their employees, then they can do the same. Okay, I appreciate your comments. Thank you, Chair. All right. <coughs> we want uh, John. Now, Chair, thank you, and can I also add my thanks to the Minister for being here today to take her questions. I'm going to return to, to the I think, established format of, of two permissible questions and try to be brief in doing so. I hope the Minister will accept that. First one based on a, a general and ongoing issue around the Agriculture Bill and the implications of that, of course, for Northern Ireland. And many of us here and others have spoken about the unique um, agri and agri food circumstances in so many areas in, in Northern Ireland. Um, can, can I ask in relation to that if, the, if this committee's uh, expressed preference, the preference expressed in response to the uh, LCM and the Agriculture Bill for a sunset clause in relation to Northern Ireland has been progressed by the Department, uh, what preparations have been made in general, and also, of course, if they have been linked to uh, any amendments that are being laid at Westminster. The second question, environmentally related, based on if there is a good thing that has come out of COVID-19 at all, it is perhaps the acceptance that there have been some environmental benefits. We all know that, that pollution is reduced as a direct consequence of less traffic on the roads. I think we accept that wildflowers are growing where, where grass is cut more regularly, and I think across the board there is an acceptance that that is a good thing to happen. So can I ask in relation to that if the Department is trying to harness information around that and take it forward and build policies around that into the future? And if they intend to link with others in doing so. Okay. Um, I'll ask Norm to take the first question, and I'll deal with the environmental one. Uh, in terms of <coughs> the uh, environmental benefits, I done three meetings this morning. <laughs> um, I done three meetings this morning. Um, probably about forty people in those meetings, and everybody was. I think most people were in their own homes, and there were perfectly good meetings. So there were. And I just d can't see going forward how we go back to how it was. I, don't get me wrong. An assembly chamber, I think that it's a debating chamber, and, and by and large, you need to be in a debating chamber. 
And if you want to close the deal with someone, you probably want to be sitting across the table from them and, and, and look them in the eye when you're doing that. Um, but there's loads and loads and loads of meetings out there which are quite technical in nature and, and, and you can go through them. And funny, I was talking to a, a guy who's an engineering company and they, they were able to um, buy, buy some additional software and you know, they were, could you turn to um, 3B there and, and bring up that drawing and so forth and they were able to... Mm -hmm. You know, put the the red marker exactly where it was and so forth that they were talking about, and he was saying from as an engineering company, he was doing business in London, and they're working on the drawing and design and all of that there, that they were able to do everything that they could previously have done, um, through a, a format like that. So, you know, that's that's going to take cars off the road. That's going to reduce pressure on our roads, and you know that's always been an issue for all of us. We keep building more roads, and we keep getting more cars. Um, yep. So, you know, there, there there is a real chance. There's a benefit to people in terms of their childcare and all of that. There, so someone takes a few minutes and drops their kid off at school, and they're straight back to work again. Um, you know, they can, they can lift their children. You know, there's there are so many benefits from it, and it's keeping families together as well. So, home working is something where people have sort of They've toyed with the idea, but they've never actually embraced it. But now that we've been forced to embrace it, I think that there's great opportunities for that. And the same applies when it comes to flying. Many meetings have people went over to join with each other in London or Manchester and various places, which has involved flights or, or people are flying to America back and forwards all of the time and, and all around the world. I don't see, and, and it's going to hit the airline industry, I don't see that there's going to be the need for all of the flights that there was in the past. Um, but to me, that is a good thing. That's a positive thing. And it'll be good for the environment, and it'll be good for people. Um, that there'll be less travelling, and there'll be far better use um, of the technology that has existed. Um, but we have never actually fully embraced that technology. <laughs> in a way that we have been forced to embrace that right now. Norman, do you want to take the question about the... Thank you. Yeah, the, the Ag Bill is, uh, I suppose, now effectively paused. I think it's at the second reading stage. Um, so uh, the, the LCM was, was passed uh, a number of weeks ago. Uh, we took that uh, debate. Uh, so that was fed through. Uh, so the consent has now been given uh, for uh, the elements within the bill uh, that relate to Northern Ireland. Uh, and our expectation is in that uh, that will now proceed on from there. Uh, so that's that's the next stage uh, within the process. Uh, sorry, Chairman, not hearing totally well in here today. But um, the, the, I think the, the wishes of the committee in relation to the sunset clause were that the department would start preparing policy with a view to a uh, legislative process further down the line with an indicative timing of 2024. And I'm aware there may be other timings out there, mm -hmm. amendments in other places, but if we could try to ascertain, is that being looked at also? I think the, the LCM was passed uh, within the bill, so I don't, I don't recall that there was any, uh, anything within the LCM motion uh, that, that uh, asked for a sunset clause to be inserted within uh, the, uh, the Northern Ireland uh, annex uh, within the bill. Yep. Cheers. Yeah. Um, Pat. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank your officials. And no doubt when I seen your COVID uh, refill or, or, or you, your response in the chamber that there's a lot of work being done from home and it's, uh, it's shown. Uh, Minister, uh, I'm looking at the world markets and you might have a better insight into that. I know that Harry had brought up that on milk. Uh, I believe that they may well be opening up again or trying to be up uh, to buy that dry powdered milk, which was, is probably one of, one of our key, along with what you've already said, the increase that's on cheeses. And uh, just to indulge me just a little bit more, I, like yourself, I have to agree. And I believe that the world, uh, how we do business has changed. And I believe that the opportunities mm -hmm. uh, for that will also change. And from those opportunities, they will grow out. Yes, it's regrettable of the deaths that we have had, but 
all farms, as you stated yourself last week, are businesses, and they will be looking at opportunities. And there will be opportunities now, Minister, when we try to come out of this. And I'm looking at uh, uh, small rural farms, uh, people not travelling abroad as much, trying to grow our hospitality and our tourism industry mm -hmm. in light with those yep. farms and the opportunities that have come out of that. We're going to have to relook, and it's going to have to be cross-cutting. We're going to have to look at our planning. But no doubt, Minister, my question comes that your department is planning for this, no doubt, at the moment, and you yourself, I'm sure, see those opportunities. But before I, I, I just finish, Minister, my reason for thinking that you may not have come today was with the passing of your father, and I know how close he meant to all your family. And last night, uh, I got a call from yourself for me to pass on uh, your, your regard, the concerns and to Anne, John Dalit's uh, wife. Um, it, I, I just think it shows, I know with your busy schedule, that you still have time for those small common touches that mean so much. And I want to thank you for that. Thank, thank you, uh, Pat, for, for the comments. And, uh, I think one other observation that, that we perhaps can make as well. I don't think there's anybody starving as a result of COVID. There may be in, in, in some parts of the world. I haven't been made aware of it over and above what, what would normally be the case. Um, but there's less food required. And my suspicion on that one is that there's less food thrown out at home than there is in the food service sector which now accounts for 40 per cent of our food. And when it comes to the issue of feeding the world and the burgeoning population of the world and the pressure that puts on primary production and on the environment as a consequence of trying to produce more and more food to, to feed more and more people, um, we should not lose sight of the issue of food waste and seeking to reduce the amount of food that is actually wasted and thrown out. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be borne in mind. It doesn't necessarily help the, the, the farmer uh, in a way, but at the same time, um, as we go forward, we shouldn't be wasting food. And uh, certainly you mentioned my father, it, it was something that wasn't wasted in their house because there was, there was 10 youngsters and a whole lot of our, our families would be the same. <laughs> he just didn't... They were brought up in a scenario where, where the... the you know, they always had food, but but there wasn't there wasn't a surplus of it. There wasn't a fridge full of it, and uh, you weren't too worried about use by dates or sell by dates when they were growing up. And uh, I was always taught as a child to finish my dinner, and that's 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 proven to be a problem as I've become an adult because I still finish my dinner, whether I need it or not. But anyway, I appreciate what you say, Pat. Um, I recognise that we can't keep we can't keep going on the way we've been going on. Um, and you know, it's crazy that you can fly um, from Belfast to London cheaper than you can get a train from Birmingham or Manchester to London. That just doesn't strike me as being logical, but we're capable of doing that. But there's a there's an impact upon the environment, and, and we do need to recognise that, and we need to try to to reduce all of that. And I want people to be as free as possible to, to travel where they want to. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to recognise that there's been an awful lot of travel that has taken place that hasn't been required, and we really need to reduce that. I should say that I warmly welcome the announcement that Kilroot is changing from coal-fired um, to gas-fired. And uh, that is going to be a major benefit um, in terms of Northern Ireland's um, production of, of um, greenhouse gases, and uh, I think that's 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 something which is very very significant that has been announced in the last 24 hours. It wasn't our department, um, but as um, someone who's res responsibility for the environment, I think that is a, a very good. Um, given that we are producing over 40 percent of our electric from renewable sources. Um, it is good that we're moving away from from a, a, a fuel like coal in that circumstance as well. Before I move on round, um, uh, William, is, is Morris are you still online there? I am indeed, sir. Yeah. Morris, do you want to yeah. ask a question? Or you're very quiet yeah, there as yeah, you were. Yeah, please, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank the minister for his, for his uh, 
his answers is that I don't have to be some past eight kids this afternoon, so thank you very much, Master. Uh, I'd just like to pick up a point on horticulture uh, and the, the, the reason that it's vital to have it reopened is our big stores, B&Q and Homebase, who sell horticultural products, are open. Uh, so we shouldn't be hampering our own garden centres because they are open in other ways to the bigger stores. But my, my question to the Minister is to look at the inn and angling, particularly uh, liver and sea angling. Uh, it's a largely solitary uh, activity and it's easy to maintain social distancing, especially in liver angling. It's therapeutic. It generates income through uh, licence purchases, tackle purchases, baits and rod and reel updates, etc. And, and I think that angling should be looked at uh, as one of the one of the, the options we have to get people out and about uh, and return some sort of normality to Northern Ireland. Th th thank you, Morris. And I have a, a lot of sympathy for what you're saying um, because lockdown has been very hard on people. Um, and whilst m many of us have enjoyed spending more time with our families, um, in some instances where domestic violence is, is prevalent, it's certainly not an enjoyable experience. It's made matters worse. And where people have mental health issues and people have stress issues, um, things like gardening and angling and walking um, are, are things which, which actually relieve um, stress and which can help in mental health. And uh, I know particularly with people with PTSD that many of them, you know, just enjoy getting out to the riverside there and they're out there on their own for a few hours and it's solitary <laughs> and they've peace and quiet and they engage in what they're doing and they're not doing harm to anybody else um, uh, while they're engaging in that. And consequently, I, I, I believe that we should be moving to um, reopen the, 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 the angling. Um, I put a phone call into the, the, the health minister yesterday on the issue. I've asked him to come back to me on it. Um, but it's something that I do think that we should be seriously moving on. Again, we're sort of caught in this business about shouldn't really be travelling. Um, so uh, if we do open it up, is it just for people who are there in walking distance or cycling distance of, of, of a, a local river or reservoir or whatever? Um, but I do think that angling is, is pretty much a solitary pursuit where people go out and generally in ones or, or twos. And if you go out with somebody else to do angling, you don't tend to stand close together because you only get uh, your lines caught and so forth. So, you know, social distancing isn't a problem for anglers. Really, really isn't. Um, and uh, aside from the issue of travelling, um, there isn't much grounds not to have angling brought back again. Thank you very much for that answer. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Thank Morris. you, Sheriff. Right, Morris. William, you're looking in there for. Yes, and. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, on, on that same issue, I had uh, anglers onto me yesterday about the very same issue, so uh, it's good to hear that question was asked. In relation to uh, TB, and I know I welcome the fact that the Minister has raised the age of young calves that need to be tested, uh, when does the Minister see TB being restored to some sort of a testing being restored to some sort of normality? Well, while we're not enforcing TB testing on farmers, um, farmers and vets can TB test where they are confident um, that they can um, socially isolate from each other. So TB testing is actually continued and is happening at around 50% of the rate that it was previously happening. So there clearly is a demand, and I can understand why many farmers, particularly at this time of year, before well, cattle are out, pretty much going out now. Uh, and, and have been out, uh, but before large numbers of cattle are put away to, you know, out farms and so forth, and it's it's much more difficult to gather them up, that they'd want to do that, and perhaps the handling facilities are better on the main farm as well. Uh, so there has been an element of TB testing has taken place, and we have created um, certain flexibilities. So someone who was required a test um, within seven days of of that requirement wasn't able to sell left the space for 35 days and so forth. Um, we've upped the age to 180 days for the first first test to be required and so forth. 
So there's a whole series of steps that we have taken to facilitate um, the, the farming community uh, in terms of TB testing, and I'm actually heartened by the amount of testing that has taken place by agreement between farmers and vets, because it means we're not hit with the same huge backlog um, that could have built up and would be much easier for us to handle whenever we get a bit more space. But I would expect it'll be. I don't expect it to be uh, done in weeks, but uh, as we, we'll keep a watching brief on COVID, and when we feel that comfortable that it's safe to do so, um, then we'll move on it. Okay. Okay. Let Rosemary in very briefly because yeah. we have to be out of here. This is just. <laughs> I'm not in any hurry now. Oh, <laughs> hot we're, of we're, the we'll press. Be <laughs> Minister, hot of the press. Um, just had an email to say that the UK government have just announced a new fund which will enable dairy farmers in England to access up to 10,000 each to help them overcome the impact of the coronavirus outbreak. Um, so, yeah, you, I'm, I'm aware of that one, and it's not particularly helpful to us. Not helpful oh. to it here. Um, that, that, that scheme is for around just over 500 farmers in England right. who dump milk. and yeah. the ten, It is up to £10,000 to cover up to 50% of the loss. That they took in dumping milk. Mm -hmm. uh, so, whilst it's better than a poke in the eye, they're still facing considerable losses. Remarkably, in, in most times, whenever there's been pressure on milk prices, the liquid milk market has been stronger. So, England is England's 80% liquid milk, 20% um, processing, and we're basically the reverse, with 80% processing, 20% liquid. And it's because England has a huge market for liquid milk, and, and uh, it's on their doorstep. And milk doesn't travel well; it tra travels better as cheese or butter or, or the other products. So, we have always been, in, and remarkably, in this occasion, liquid milk has taken the hit more than the cheeses and butters and so forth. So, <coughs> that that was done because a number of the milk companies. Um, lost big orders with, with some of those, those companies that was using huge quantities of liquid milk, and they just couldn't take the milk. Subsequently, the farmer had to dump the milk uh, until they found other markets for it. So that's what it's aimed at. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's not what I've been pushing George Eustace for, but. Yeah, okay. All right. No, I just seen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, okay, folks, um, I'm going to have to move on here. I'd like to. Uh, Thank, thank you, uh, Minister Putz and Norman and David, for attending uh, the committee meeting here today. And no doubt we'll be um, we'll be in contact, and he'll be with us again in the future, and hopefully in a in a post-COVID future where we all can, or as many of us possible, yeah. can survive this escape as far as possible. Well, thank you very much. Good health to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Oops, um, number four. Okay, Morris said goodbye, Minister. Enjoy Sunny Port Stewart there. You tell you enjoy Sunny Port Stewart, Morris. Right, see him down there. See you down there. <laughs> 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 Another one bites the dust. Thank you, Lee. Okay, right. Um, okay, folks. Uh, SLL, SL1 uh, payments to farmers, crop diversification derogation regulation 2020. The Minister issued correspondence with the committee considered last week at the meeting of uh, intention to forward SL1 and SR to the committee for consideration. The letters at page 38 to 39 and the SL and the SRs at 40 to 45. It did before the assembly on 3rd of April under confirmatory procedure coming operation on 1st of May. The SR was made in response to requests from the representative to reduce derogation from crop diversification requirements for 2020 due to adverse weather conditions. It means that farmers will not be required to plant more than one crop the 2020 direct payment scheme here. Um, okay, uh, so do that. <laughs> okay, with that then. Yeah. Yeah, remember, uh, move to the next stage. Do you want to ask any questions? Oh, sorry, still here. <laughs> <laughs> I never walked out the door with no, 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 no. <laughs> I thought there was a typo with a note here that Norman. Norman. <laughs> and then I questioned what asked Norman about that. Any members, any other questions? Any questions to, they want to ask uh, Norm? I suppose Norman, I'll ask you. 
Is the derogation applied automatically, or do farmers apply individually for it? No, it's an automatic. It's, a, it's a basically switching off the crop diversification requirement for this year and this year, yeah. this year only. Uh, so it's because of the, the adverse uh, weather conditions that we had over the back end and the early part of this year, where farmers would have really struggled uh, to perhaps meet the, the, the three crop and the two crop rule. Yeah. Uh, so it's only for this year. It's not a change in policy. So mm -hmm. um, it is that temporary measure. And what's the situation in the South Norman, do you know? They have actually not gone for a, a derogation per se, but they will use force majeure yeah. uh, conditions to actually achieve the same thing. Uh, yeah. but this, this gives better certainty uh, to farmers, so farmers don't have to apply per se, mm. it, it, it's just available. Yeah. Um, and it's a relatively small number of farmers we're talking about here, about 300 to the two crop and the three crop uh, elements of it. Thanks. I hear what you're saying as well uh, about it just being for this year that it's not a, a change but this year it's been caused by adverse weather conditions mm -hmm. and given the trajectory of the climate emergency that we have and the weather pattern shifts that we're experiencing i'm going to make an assumption that there are conversations at least happening about this potentially happening again next year or subsequent years and um, what are the plans for that then if this is just a one year is next year going to be a one year and then another one year Yep. So, uh, I mean, it has happened in the past. I think uh, only a couple of years ago, uh, where we, we had to get a, a derogation at, at EU level uh, and apply for that. Uh, so, yes, it does happen. Um, but I think that then this takes us into the future of uh, agricultural support. This was introduced uh, as part of the greening arrangements uh, on the 2013 reforms. Um, now, greening itself uh, hasn't had much by way of any impact or benefit for Northern Ireland. Uh, it was largely to deal with very intensive green growing areas, uh, which we are not. Uh, so if you go to the Paris Basin, for example, uh, this would be a more appropriate um, issue around uh, ecological focus areas and retention of permanent pasture and crop rotation, uh, which are the issues uh, within the greening element of it. So in terms of the relevance of all of that to Northern Ireland, where 94% of our land is grassland, uh, it's not really relevant. It's not really delivering much by way of an environmental benefit. And therefore, going forward, we certainly want to look to, to this and say, you know, is this worth retaining? Because it has such uh, a minimal impact, minimal benefit, uh, but it brings a lot of administration, administration uh, uh, along with it. So therefore, there are probably better things that we could be doing uh, than perpetuating uh, this particular uh, mechanism which was to deal with other people's problems, not ours. Okay. Well, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> okay, so, members okay then? Yep. Right, Norman, so, uh, members can take this policy move to the next stage. Okay. Thank you, Norman. Okay. Great. 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 So, just in terms of any other business, Barbara Love has returned to work and has joined our meeting today from home. Um, Barbara is working on the Environment Bill and is aiming to bring a paper to the Committee on the Consideration of Evidence and the Identification of Three Key Issues for the week commencing the 18th of May. That should enable the Committee to be in a position to finalise the report of the Environment Bill on the week commencing the 1st of June. The finalised report can be put on hold until, after, until the situation regarding the Bill Committee in Westminster is clear. Members of any other Items of business they wish to raise? Sure. Uh, just with what the Minister was saying and what we've seen at other committees that we go to, I really do think that we have to put on record our thanks to the clerk and to yeah. all the staff of the committee for the way that, that, that we're still able to operate and still able to function as best we possible can the mechanisms of government. And I don't think that that was an easy task, but it is working, and it shows us maybe a light and a way forward. Yeah, I think we all agree with that. Yep. yep. I think, Chair, it's nice to meet in person too. You know when we can. Yeah. Good like, You're bad next, Harry. <laughs> no, I, I do agree. Uh, although next week it will be informal using we'll Microsoft Teams, but we like certainly like should look Agreed. back at yeah. getting back, back around informal Thanks. Back to Thursday. Back Thursday. Yeah. Thursday. 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 Thursday morning as usual. Thursday morning. Next yes. certain tomorrow yeah. week. Yeah, and we'll do a company meet like this when there's a need to. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. well done. Okay, yeah. folks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank, 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 thank you all very much. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.